Decision night in America. This election night will be historic no matter who wins. America's presidential elections are global showstoppers. Across presidential battlegrounds. In America alone, tens of millions tune in live to election night coverage. This year will be like no other. From mass voting by mail, to hours-long waits at polling places, delayed results, and the rise of disinformation. I'm John Fassman, The Economist Washington Correspondent. I've assembled a team of experts with decades of experience with America's electoral system to discuss what could go wrong with this year's election. Difficult elections are not new for America. Putting on a show of unity for the cameras. But there's never been a presidential election held during an epidemic that has killed more than 200,000 Americans and involving a president with little regard for democratic norms and institutions. Will you commit here today for a peaceful transfer of power? We want to have get rid of the ballots and you'll have a very trans you'll have a very peaceful there won't be a transfer frankly there'll be a continuation. The potential for chaos is huge. I'd like to paint a scenario for you. It's election night, maybe 65, 70% of the mail-in ballots have so far been counted, and Donald Trump holds a commanding lead. What are your worries about this particular period of the election? What do you think might happen? If we're in a position where hundreds of thousands or millions of ballots in decisive states can't be counted until after election night, that is going to be an explosive situation. And I don't think telling voters to be patient, the media saying, wait, it may be four days, it may be a week. I just don't think that's going to be enough in the situation we face. The fact is, is that there will be an information vacuum on election night. We have an example from this election cycle, the Iowa caucuses. The results weren't particularly clear because the process was confused. Let's think about that on steroids on election night with at least one candidate uh, in particular who we know will is likely to lie about the results of the election. So I I will jump in. Um, what, What worries me is where a significant number of Americans don't accept the outcomes as fair. If we don't figure out a way to stave off these problems or unless there are landslide victories across the country, the immediate aftermath of the election is going to tear the country apart. Primary elections held during the epidemic have already shown what can go wrong. The Wisconsin primary on April 7th was chaotic. They were short 7,000 poll workers, and many polling places were closed. In November 2016, Milwaukee, the biggest city in Wisconsin, had 182 polling places. In this year's primary, there were just five. Was it easy to find this place, Mom? No, it was very difficult. (laughs) How many miles outside the city are we? Two and a half miles. We did a study of um, turnout, the turnout effect of Wisconsin's long lines in their April primary and found that um, more than, uh, that, that, that those long lines depressed turnout by more than 8.3% and that those effects weren't felt evenly across the board. For African American voters in particular, turnout went down by more than 10%. Those lines are leading to lost votes. Barriers to voting, particularly for non-white voters, predate the epidemic. A complex patchwork of laws, regulations, and practices often place burdens that fall heaviest on voters of color. Even before COVID-19, black and Hispanic voters were more likely than whites to have to wait in line to cast their ballots. Between 2012 and 2018, almost 1,700 polling places closed. Most of those were in majority minority areas. Monet, you are waging one of the most important voting rights fights in perhaps the most important state in America. What are you seeing on the ground? In a state like Florida, voter suppression does begin before we even make it to the ballot box. We've seen precinct locations being moved without notification being sent to voters. We've seen voters removed simply because their last names were ethnic sounding and there was some Um, fear that they may not be eligible to vote. 
This year, non-whites make up a third of the American electorate, the highest ever share. There are a lot of votes to be won or lost. Organizations like Monet Holder's New Florida Majority are taking the fight for voting access to the courts. The most recent litigation actually began in March when the pandemic first hit and we um, filed to do an emergency injunction to expand the timeline for early voting and for returning ballots and requesting them. There are at least 228 court cases pending in I think 43 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Rick, is that an unusual amount of cases? This is of course unprecedented. We've never seen this level of litigation in advance of an election. The litigation is being brought by political parties and their affiliates. These lawsuits mainly concern changes to voting rules brought about by the epidemic. One of the biggest concerns is the rise in voting by mail. In 2016, voting by mail was not widely used, as many states required voters to provide an excuse for why they couldn't vote in person. But in this election, almost all states will allow voting by mail, with either no excuse needed or with fear of contracting COVID-19 as a valid excuse. And nine states in Washington, D.C. are even mailing a ballot to every registered voter. Yet many underfunded electoral districts are woefully unprepared. States have experienced challenges in accommodating that surge, and voters are, votes are being lost along the way for failure to process absentee ballots on time, for mail delays where people don't receive them on time, and for counting problems where states are um, unable to um, or, or are rejecting a, a, an ex inordinately large number of those ballots compared to usual years. Right now, we're, we're predicting that we'll have about 4.2 million absentee ballots or vote-by-mail ballots in Florida, and we're scared that the Postal Service may not deliver them. There may not be enough poll workers within our, our, our county election offices to actually hand open and process those. Despite the concerns, voting by mail remains the safest way to vote in an epidemic. But you wouldn't know that if you listened to President Trump. Mail-in ballots are very dangerous. There's tremendous fraud involved and tremendous illegality. This will be, in my opinion, the most corrupt election in the history of our country, and we cannot let this happen. No evidence exists that supports the president's claims. And studies have shown that voting by mail boosts turnout, but favors neither party. The strategy here that we've seen play out over the last few weeks is based on misleading people about how to vote. Disinformation about not only the results of the election, but also when, where, and how to vote. Do you think Donald Trump is doing the Russians' job for them this cycle? I think that it, Donald Trump is, is doing a very good job of not being uh, burdened by facts uh, about our democracy. What we've seen from actors like Russia is a willingness to kind of exploit that, to stop creating their own content, and frankly, just take existing content and amplify it a little bit more. Is Trump's rhetoric harming sort of perceptions of fairness in this election? Absolutely. Voters are in fear that their votes will not be counted. Our greatest worry is that um, being in the midst of a global pandemic, voters will feel that they have to either choose between their health and participating in democracy, and with all of the things considered, they may choose to sit this one out. As usual, there is a you know, kernel of truth on which this whole edifice of disinformation is built. There are going to be some glitches, um, some meltdowns, some lines, some lost votes, but the magnitude of it is much smaller than being made to believe. And if Americans vote early, um, that should mitigate any of these problems. According to the Economist model, as of the end of September, President Trump is unlikely to win a second term. But there is still over a month to go, and the contest is likely to tighten and grow more heated. In 2000, when the Supreme Court ruled in favor of George W. Bush, Al Gore graciously stepped aside. This has been an extraordinary election. Its very closeness can serve to remind us that we are one people with a shared history and a shared destiny. The loser in this year's contest may not bow out so gracefully. 
and that could have a lasting impact on the esteem in which both Americans and the world hold the country's democracy.